Okay. <clears throat> good morning, good morning, brothers and sisters, and happy Sabbath. As we are about to open this Sabbath day's presentations, shall we ask our Heavenly Father for His guidance, for His direction and His blessing in those things that we should consider? Shall we pray? Gracious Father in Heaven, we thank You for these Sabbath hours where we may come before You reflect upon the many blessings that you have been providing and look to enter even more fully into the rest that you are providing for us. We ask now, Father, that your spirit may be with us, that your angels may attend us. We seek your blessing. We ask, Father, that the words that are presented may be those of yours that you would have us to hear at this time. Direct us now. Be with us, I pray. Hide me behind your cross. May your character shine through. Be with us now, we ask, we pray, and we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> Throughout this week, we have been addressing many of the examples that we have been shown in the book of Judges. What we're going to look at today is going to come from the Signs of the Times, 2nd of June, 1881, and possibly from a few other documents. But our opening verses today are going to come from Judges 2, verses 1 through 5. So if you could turn with me, please, to Judges chapter 2, verses 1 to 5. Then we will begin. Judges 2, 2, chapter 1, or excuse me, Judges 2, verse 1. And an angel of the Lord came up from Gilgal to Bochim and said, I made you go up out of Egypt and have brought you unto the land which I swear unto your fathers. And I said, I will never break my covenant with you. Does an angel have the ability to make a covenant with anyone? Then who is speaking here? As we're going to be seeing, this is none other than Christ. And ye shall make no league with the inhabitants of this land. Ye shall throw down their altars, but ye have not obeyed my voice. Why have you done this? Wherefore I also said, I will not drive them out from before you. But they shall be as thorns in your sides, and their gods shall be a snare unto you. And it came to pass, when the angel of the Lord spake these words unto all of the children of Israel, that the people lifted up their voice and wept. And they called the name of that place Bochim, and they sacrificed there unto the Lord. Although the last admit admonitions of Joshua and the solemn covenant which Israel had made with God seemed to make a deep impression upon them, 
Yet time soon proved that the influence was not permanent. After the death of their leader and of the elders who were associated with him, the people began gradually to relapse into idolatry. Are we not seeing this occurring today within the movement and within the church? Joshua had been permitted to drive out, excuse me, Joshua had not been permitted to drive out all of the inhabitants of the land. A remnant of the heathen nations were spared for a time that the Lord might through them test the faith and the obedience of his people and that those whose hearts were cherishing idolatry might be revealed and punished. This example is showing us that the Lord wants to know of us today, are we willing to trust Him? Or are we going to fail as did the children of Israel? This is a fearsome thought. The generation that succeeded Joshua were directed to carry forward the work which he had left unfinished, but they did not obey the divine command to utterly destroy the heathen. Where stand we today? Are we still doing as the pioneers? Are we making use of Miller's rules? Are we choosing to study for ourselves to understand what the Bible would say to us today? Or are we waiting for men to come to us and say, this is the way? Are we waiting on others, trained in Hebrew and Greek to tell us what the Bible says. Where does this teaching come from? Are we waiting for those that have graduated with their degrees, their Doctor of Divinity degrees, to tell us what to believe? Some of the tribes made war on the Canaanites, but failing to receive the help that they should have had from their brethren, they became weary of the conflict and spared the most dangerous enemies. Frequent intercourse soon removed all fear of danger, and now the Israelites took another step in transgression by connecting themselves in marriage with the heathen. When this was done, the difficulties of the situation were greatly increased. It was no easy matter to make war with relatives and to extirpate or banish their own kindred. What was faced by Ezra? What was the warning that was given at the time of Ezra and Nehemiah to the children of Israel? Were they not told that they were to leave their strange wives? Were they not told that they should not have intermarried with the nations around them? Yet here we're seeing the beginning of this problem. By their disregard of God's command, the Israelites had woven for themselves a net which their feet were soon entangled. Ere long, many of the Hebrews were induced to attend heathen festivals. Thus, 
<clears throat> lascivious songs and licentious indulgence formed a prominent part in the idolatrous worship. Exposed to these contaminating influences, the Israel of God steadily became corrupted. In imitation of the gods of the heathen, images were made to represent Jehovah. And thus, idolatry spread like a plague through the land. Are we children of the book? Exodus 20 laid out exactly the covenant that the children of Israel had with God. Exodus 20 through 23 is the entire book of the covenant. Are we not told we shall have no other gods before Jehovah? Are we not told we should make no graven image? Yet here, in this generation, so soon after Joshua, what are the children of Israel doing? They are abandoning the covenant, the league with Jehovah. The evil made little headway until the generation was extinct, which had made the covenant with God. But the parents had prepared the way for the apostasy of their children. God's commandments had been disregarded, his safeguards removed, his barriers broken down. What are the safeguards? What are the barriers? Is this not the wall between us and the world? Why does God erect a wall around us? Why does God seek to do such a thing? Is it not for our own protection? Is it not for our own benefit? The correct and simple habits of the Hebrews had preserved them in physical health, but association with the heathen had led to the indulgence of appetite and sensual passions, and this had lessened physical strength and enfeebled the mental and moral powers. God removed his protecting care and support, and the Israelites were no longer able to contend with their enemies. Soon they were brought into subjection to the very nations whom God, <clears throat> through whom God they might have subdued. What are they doing? They're turning their backs upon God. The Lord did not permit the sins of the people to pass without rebuke. They were still faithful worshipers in, in Israel, and many others from habit and early association attended the worship of God at the tabernacle. A large company were assembled upon the occasion of a religious feast when an angel of God, having first appeared at Gilgal, revealed himself to the congregation at Shiloh, he addressed them in words of solemn reproof. I made you go up out of Egypt and have brought you unto the land which I swear unto your fathers. And I said, I will never break my covenant with you. Can we depend on the word of God? If he says, I will never break my covenant with you, does he mean what he says? And ye shall make no league with the inhabitants of the land. Ye shall throw down their altars, but ye have not obeyed my voice. And why have you done this? 
Wherefore I also said, I will not drive them out from before you, but they shall be as thorns in your sides, and their gods shall be a snare unto you. This angel, the same that appeared to Joshua at the taking of Jericho, was no less a personage than the Son of God. It was he who brought Israel out of Egypt and established them in the land of Canaan. He showed them that he had not broken his promises to them, but they themselves had violated their solemn covenant. Brothers and sisters, are we in the same position today? Are we seeing the effects of not holding to the covenant with Jehovah? And it came to pass when the angel of the Lord spake these words unto all the children of Israel, that the people lifted up their voice and wept. And they sacrificed there unto the Lord, but their repentance produced no lasting results. What are the effects of truly keeping a covenant? It means that you have a change in your demeanor, in your very life. The people mourn because their sins had brought suffering upon themselves, but did not sorrow that God was displeased and that his name was dishonored. Are we not to honor God in everything we do? Are we not to put Him first? Is this not what we have seen from these studies that have been presented throughout this week? We're being given symbols that our Heavenly Father cares. That Jehovah Himself is watching everything that is going on. Yet, are we willing to live by the covenant with Him? True repentance includes more than sorrow for sin. It demands a resolute turning away from evil. We may profess to feel deep sorrow for our sins. We may weep over our wrong course. But if we make no change in that course, our sorrow will avail nothing. Before they entered the promised land, the Israelites had been faithfully taught their duty toward the heathen. Consider again Exodus 20 to 23 was given in a single day. It was laid out for the children of Israel before anything else went on. If we're presented with things in a single day, how many of these things do we remember? So, in mercy, our Heavenly Father repeated Himself over and over again. Not just to the Levites, but to all of Israel, to all of his children. They were to make no league with the inhabitants but to utterly destroy their idols and to cast down their altars. Now the angel, now Christ solemnly declares, you have not obeyed my voice. And in sadness he asks, why have you done this? What have we addressed several times this week is the symbol for a league.
We are going to see multiple times 158, just as 158 is here on the charts, that 158 is going to be popping up. We're going to need to remember this. 158 we're going to be able to address as being either a league with God or a league with man. A league that is holy and ordained of Jehovah or a league that is in keeping with the adversary. Which are we going to choose? The people could now see the sinfulness and ingratitude of their course. This was the golden opportunity for them to return to their allegiance to Jehovah and to bring forth fruit, meat for repentance. Had they manifested a willingness to act when duty was made known, had they entered at once upon the performance of the work that had been neglected, then the curse of Jehovah might have been turned away from Israel. But they returned to their evil ways, and the Lord left them to suffer the consequence of their own neglect. Do we want to continue to wallow in the pits of sin? Do we desire to continue to eat of the garbage of the world? Or are we willing to now partake of the heavenly manna that is being presented? Choose you this day whom you will serve. The experience of the Israelites is that of many at the present day. Now this was written in 1881. So it's, it's in the past. We don't need to worry about this, right? Who is this written for? Is it not written for us? Are we not being presented today with an admonition to our hearts. Warnings and reproofs from Jehovah are continually given to His people. Think about that. He's willing to warn us, not just once, but continually. Godly sorrow which produces repentance unto salvation would lead them to make an immediate and decided change. But here many fail. Confessions are made, sorrow is expressed, tears are shed, but there is no permanent change of life. Unless the heart is renewed by divine grace, an earnest effort is made to resist temptation, we shall be overcome again and again. What do we desire? To whom are we trusting? Among God's preferred people, there are men in responsible positions who are content to remain in a state of coldness and backsliding. May this not be said of us. Their piety vanishes at the approach of temptation. To gain the friendship of worldlings, they will risk the consequences of losing the favor of Jehovah. The Lord is trying His people as silver is tried. Closer and still closer will come the searching test. Until the heart is wholly submitted to God, 
or hardened in disobedience and rebellion. Either we're going to show the reflection of the Savior or we are going to be destroyed. Choose you this day whom you will serve. God distinguishes between those who walk in the path of self-denial and obedience, which he has marked out, and that class who choose to follow their own ways. Too late, we may see, as did the children of Israel, the folly of neglecting and disregarding God's commands. It's okay to break one commandment, right? I believe it's been clearly laid out for us. If you break one, you've broken them all. So if we break the covenant, if we decide of our own that the covenant with God means nothing, then are we walking in his paths? As the Hebrews were warned not to assemble, not to assimilate to the heathen around them, so we are warned against conforming to the spirit and the customs of the ungodly. Again, a symbol is given to us. We are not to enter into league. We are not to covenant with those that are not of God. Christ speaks to us in language that need not be misinterpreted. Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. How clear is that? How direct is that? If any man will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. Christ himself is the true pattern. His life of self-denial we are to imitate. His earnest labor for the salvation of souls we must copy. His purity and holiness must be reflected in us or we shall never be permitted to sit with him in his throne. God desires to give a message that is salvation unto all, but many choose not to accept it. That is a thought that is very scary. It is not safe for Christians to choose the society of those who have no connection with God and whose course is displeasing to Him. Yet how many professed Christians venture upon forbidden ground? Many invite to their homes relatives who are vain, trifling, and ungodly. And often the example and the influence of these irreligious visitors produce lasting impressions upon the minds of the children of the household. The influence thus exerted is similar to that which resulted from the association of the Hebrews with the godless Canaanites. God holds the parents accountable for disregarding his command to separate themselves and their families from these unholy influences. That, for me, was a very hard statement to read. I've had to consider it carefully. We must live in the world, but we are not to be of the world. We are forbidden to conform to its practices and its fashions. The friendship of the ungodly is more dangerous than their hatred. It misleads and destroys thousands who might, by a proper and holy example, be led to become children of God. The minds of the young are thus made familiar with irreligion, 
with vanity, ungodliness, pride, and immorality, and the heart not shielded by divine grace gradually becomes corrupted. Almost imperceptibly, the youth learn to love the tainted atmosphere surrounding the ungodly. Evil angels gather around them, and they lose their relish for that which is pure, refined, and ennobling. Who do we want surrounding us? Do we wish the angels of God to be around us, watching out for us, protecting us? Or do we wish to invite angels of the adversary? Choose you this day whom you will serve. Professed Christian parents will pay the greatest deference to their worldly and irreligious guests. While these very persons are leading the children of those who pay them so much polite attention away from sobriety and away from religion, the youth may be trying to lead a religious life, but the parents have invited the tempter into their household. And he weaves his net about the children. Old and young become absorbed in questionable enjoyments and the excitement of worldly pleasure. I've said this often. I refuse to point fingers because every time I have, I have three fingers pointed directly back at me. Any time that words like this are having to be presented, I am having to look at my own life and see where I have failed. Many feel that they must make some concessions to please their irreligious relatives and friends. It is not, as it is not always easy to draw the line, one concession prepares the way for another until those who were once true followers of Christ are in life and character conformed to the customs of the world. The connection with God is broken. They are Christians in name only. Consider this. What is one of the commandments? Thou shalt not take my name in vain. Are we taking the name of Christ in word only and not in action? When the test comes and their hope is seen to be without foundation, they have sold themselves and their children to the enemy. They have dishonored God, and in the revelation of his righteous judgments, they will reap what they have sown. Christ will say to them, as he said to ancient Israel, have, Ye have not obeyed my voice, why have you done this? How are parents neglecting their precious opportunities? It is their privilege to serve and honor God in their household. They should reject every form of idolatry and corruption. They should keep the atmosphere of the home pure and healthful, thus attracting holy angels to be their guests. They should educate and discipline their children to be Bible readers and Bible Christians. Is this not what we are to do in our own lives? Abraham's course in controlling his children and his household and instructing them to fear and obey God was approved of heaven. Because he had been faithful to the trust already given, God committed to him greater responsibilities making him the depository of divine truth for all the generations to come. He had honored God in his household, and God honored him before the world. It was declared that through his posterity, all the nations of the earth should be blessed. God would do great things for his people at this present day. 
have we not seen through this week the very evidences that God is leading? Have we not been experiencing that God is giving a message? He's letting us see that He is willing and able to save. The Lord is waiting and longing to reveal to us the right arm of His power. He will work mightily for us if we will but faithfully improve the opportunities and blessings already given. Watch and pray lest you enter into temptation was the admonition of Christ to his disciples. We too have need of watchfulness and earnest prayer. We are surrounded by the perils of the last days. It is a time of special danger to the young. We should feel the most intense interest to secure the salvation of the children whom God has given us. When so much is at stake, how can we set up idols in our hearts? How can we be indolent and trifling, vain, proud, and careless? We have foes to fight within. We have victories to gain over our own sinful propensities. The lust of the flesh, the lust of the eye, and the pride of life are seeking continually to weaken our spirituality. We must crucify the flesh and the affections and lusts. Let us not yield to sloth, to unbelief, and to idolatry as did the children of Israel. They and their examples are presented for us today. If the enemies of our souls are not driven out, they will increase in power and will hold us in the slavery of sin. Would you rather be a slave or would you rather be free? Choose you this day whom ye will serve. We can have no fellowship with the Lord's enemies within or around us without endangering our own souls and the souls of those whom God has committed to our care. As the Israelites were prone to idolatry, so are the people of the present age. Who is she speaking about now? Is she speaking of the children of Israel? Or is she speaking of us? The same adversary that succeeded in leading them astray is now at work with tenfold power to to entice God's professed people from their simplicity, from their sincerity, from their earnestness and their piety. His devices are all too successful. Worldly things are about to attract the attention and absorb the interest. Professed Christians unite with the ungodly, and Christ ceases to be a welcome guest. Who are we welcoming into our lives? Who is it that we are seeking to allow to be our master? The only safety for God's people is to put away the impious ambition to make a league with the world to imitate her customs and practices. They must seek a closer connection with God and give diligent heed to his word in counsels, in reproofs, and in promises. What covenant? What league? Whom are we serving? Are we being faithful as was Abraham? Are we being faithful as was Nehemiah? So, consider this. The children of Israel had not been faithful, even though that generation saw the awful power upon Sinai. 
They were a chosen nation. They were a nation that God directly desired to set above all other nations. And yet, they apostatized. In this movement, we have seen many truths from Scripture being revealed. This movement is being shown that God is about to return to the earth. In 1898, Sister White began to prepare a document that was not published for many years. This is a document that only a portion has now been presented because there are one or more typed copies of this document that contain additional handwritten interlineations additional lines which may be viewed at the Ellen White estate. They are not deemed fit for public viewing. Does that mean that all of these documents have then been published? I would have to say no. <clears throat> this document was written on the 16th day of the 7th month of the biblical year 5943. Now the 16th day of the 7th month would have been the equivalent for us of the Feast of Tabernacles. The last of the feasts ordained of Jehovah. We are currently in the final hours of the Heavenly Day of Atonement. We need to keep this in mind. The case of Nehemiah has been presented to me. He was not a man set apart for a priest or a prophet, but the Lord used him to do a special work. So if he's not set aside as a priest, he was not of the tribe of Levi. If he was not set aside as a prophet, he is just a man. Brothers and sisters, God can use any man, any woman that is willing to seek him with their whole, entire, complete heart to do a work. We need to decide whom we look to serve. He was a leader of the people, but his fidelity to God did not rest upon his position. Was he then an employee of the conference? Was he then selected or elected to this? No. This is Nehemiah, the cupbearer to the king. What is he bringing to the king in the cup? He's bringing the wine. And what is the wine? What is that an example of? Is it not an example of doctrine? He is coming before the most powerful monarch at that time. He's dealing with the rich and powerful, yet he sees his responsibility to his brothers and sisters 
that are living and not lifting up the character of Jehovah. The children of Israel were taken captive to Babylon because they had separated from God and no longer felt that it was their duty to maintain principles unadulterated by the sentiments of the nations around them. Because of their separation from Jehovah, the Lord humbled them. He could not work for their prosperity. He could not fulfill his covenant with them while they were untrue to the principles that he had given them to zealously maintain that they might be kept from the methods and practices of the heathen nations who dishonored him. By their spirit and their works, the children of Israel misrepresented the righteousness of Jehovah's character, and the Lord permitted them to be taken captive. He left them to their own ways, and the innocent suffered with the sinners in Zion. Is this occurring today? are the innocent suffering with the sinners. If it is, change needs to be made. But among the children of Israel, there were Christian patriots. Wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. She writes this in 1898, saying that among the children of Israel... Among the children before Christ's advent, there were Christian patriots who were as true as steel to the principle. And upon these loyal and true men, the Lord looked with great pleasure. Are we to stand for God as did Abraham? Are we to stand for him as did Deborah and Barak? Are we to stand for him as did Daniel? Are we to be as true to principle as they were? These were men who would not be corrupted by selfishness nor mar the work of God by following erroneous methods and practices. Men who would honor Jehovah at the loss of all things. They had to suffer with the guilty, but in the providence of God, this captivity was the means of bringing them to the front and their example of untarnished integrity while captives at Babylon shines with heaven's luster. Many of the Lord's chosen people had proved themselves untrustworthy. They had separated from him and become selfish, scheming, and dishonorable. The part acted by Daniel and his fellows and by Ezra and Nehemiah was in marked contrast to this, and the Lord specially blessed these men for standing up firmly for the right. There are many times that we are presented with situations. We are chided in the way that we approach the scriptures. We are chided and told that we were being too old-fashioned. We have people making fun of the way we dress. We have people telling us that our diet is wrong. Yet, Are we walking in the path that God would have us to walk? 
if we are following him because it's right, is he not going to walk with us and bless us with his presence? Nehemiah and Ezra were men of opportunity. The Lord had a special work for them to do. They were to call upon the people to consider their ways and to see where they had made their mistake. For the Lord had not suffered his people to become powerless and confused and to be taken into captivity without a cause. Think about that for a minute. When else have we seen people that have had to consider where they made a mistake. Did we not see this after October 22, 1844? Was there not a great disappointment at that time and a lack of understanding of what God was trying to say? The man that had led them, William Miller, Stepped away. He made a decision that what he had been led to do, while it was correct, while it was according to the Bible, or as we are being told, that on this chart and on this chart, that these, like the two tables described in Habakkuk, are ordained of God that something had been wrong. At some point, if you should travel, it may be worth a visit to the grave of William Miller. For are we not told that the angels of God are protecting this very dust of this man of God? He may not have accepted everything from the scriptures. He may not have come to the understanding of the Sabbath, but God has recognized that he was a faithful watchman and even his dust is watched by the angels of God. The Lord's work will not be hindered, even though the workmen may prove unworthy. God has men in reserve prepared to meet the demand that his work may be preserved from all contaminating influences. God will be honored and glorified. When the divine spirit impresses the mind of the men appointed by God as fit for the work, he responds saying, Here am I, send me. Isaiah 6 verse 8. How does the servant of the Lord respond? Here am I. How does the Son of God respond? Here I am. Nehemiah found the book of the law and the eighth chapter of Nehemiah gives the particulars of the influence that the reading of God's requirement had upon the people. In the ninth chapter, the works of the Lord in behalf of his people are repeated. The sins of the people in turning from God are pointed out. These sins had separated them from God and he had permitted them to be brought under the control of heathen nations. Consider carefully this from the 8th chapter of Nehemiah. Nehemiah was chosen by God because he was willing to cooperate with God as a restorer. 
Are we today willing to cooperate with God? Are we willing today to be restored into communion with God? What is the symbol of restoration? If we are ever to look and find symbols such as this combined, is that important for us to pay attention with? Are we to be restored into communion with our Creator? This history has been recorded for our benefit. This history of the children of Israel and of Nehemiah is recorded for us to use to learn. What has been will be, and we need to look to God for counsel. We must not trust to the counsel of men. We need increased discernment that we may distinguish between truth and error. Too many times, in too many ways, we turn to the creation rather than turning to the Creator. The history of the children of Israel as recorded in Nehemiah shows the sure result of turning from Bible principles to the customs and the practices of men. Is this not so from what we've seen in the book of Judges? The Lord will not serve with any devising to gratify the selfishness of men and blight his work. He will not give prosperity to plans that lead away from fidelity to his commandments. Do we wish to prosper? Or do we desire to do that which God would have us to do and for his character and his work to show us that which is true prosperity. He demands that the talents lent to man shall be used in keeping the way of the Lord, in doing justice and judgment, whether it be to break down or to restore and to build up. God would not have us follow the wisdom of men who have disregarded the word of God and made themselves a reproach by their very practices and counsels. They have laid themselves as manacled victims on the altar of mammon and the plainest, simplest principles of Christianity are disregarded by them. Satan triumphs, for the light of the Son of Righteousness does not shine into their hearts. May this not be said of us. Now, Do we have any questions or comments at this time? Shall we then close in prayer? Gracious Father in heaven, we thank you for these many examples that you have provided for us, for these admonitions through which we need to learn. Please be with us now. Direct us through this day. Help us so that what we do, what we say, what we think, what we speak, may lift 
up your character in all ways. We thank you for these Sabbath hours and ask, Father, that we may truly rest knowing that you have our best interests at heart. For this we thank you, for this we praise you. In the name of Jesus, amen.